This week on FX Guide TV. We're at ILM to look at the biblical epic Noah. And we look at the new April term from fxphd.com. This and more coming up next. Without a doubt, one of the world's great VFX companies is ILM. Mike recently had the chance to visit the Presidio in San Francisco for this great look at the new biblical drama, Noah, which contains some of the most complex renders ILM have ever done. Thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, this definitely. is a, a really good uh, effects film. It's obviously an interesting film because it's very idea driven. How did ILM approach it? Um, well, you're right. I mean, uh, I think with Darren Aronofsky, there's this great sense of kind of originality you know, with everything he creates, you know, and especially in kind of a, you know, an industry where we have lots of movies that might kind of reference each other or, or whatever, that's not Darren's thing. I mean, anything he creates, I think it's, there's a uniqueness to his ideas. So when he came here and uh, he, he met with Ben Snow, uh, the effects soup on the show, I think they, they struck a very strong collaboration and because he, he had this idea in his head and he and his co-writer Ari Handel, they had kind of developed this graphic novel as well of how they wanted to depict this story, this kind of great epic story. And uh, I think, you know, ILM really enjoyed kind of the challenge of, of, of kind of bringing his, his vision to the, to the big screen. It's an exciting movie. And, and you were central to a very exciting part of it. Tell us about the battle sequence. Yeah, the battle sequence is the epic uh, culmination of Noah's effort to um, build the ark and rescue the animals and get ready for the big storm that's brewing. So our big challenge was to create this giant battle um, that's supposed to take place in the daytime under stormy conditions. But of course, you can't order a stormy rainy day so the scene was actually filmed in the middle of the night with large banks of lights on giant cranes so we had a lot of big challenges of figuring out how to integrate the actual plates that were shot and um, change the nighttime sourcey lighting into an overcast more ambiently lit giant stormy sequence through the course of the sequence, it's supposed to get stormier and stormier. And by the end of the sequence, the whole thing is just going to hell in a handbasket. Geysers are shooting out of the earth, and this giant flood comes and sweeps all of humanity away, basically, and takes the ark floating off into the ocean. So we had to start from no rain um, and just sunny skies to slowly having the clouds building and culminating to having light rain spattering down um, and slowly having the progression of it getting stormier and stormier through the whole sequence. Was the lighting on set being adjusted during the course of the sort of shooting for that or was it just that we're going to give you a, a base to work with and you're going to have to do the progression? It was just a base to start with. The whole thing was shot at night. Um, so it was the job of lighting and compositing to make it all work together and have a progression that made sense through the sequence of it getting stormier and stormier. So that was a big challenge for sure. Because I mean, in a, in a technical sense, you know, you, to replicate lighting, you could do HDRs and sample what was there and then of course use those to project out. But it's sounding like what you're saying is you've got quite directional light at the shoot level, while of course you'd have a very diffused sky dome at the, at the you know, if you were doing it in a perfect world in a perfect uh, setup, is that right? Yes. So definitely compositing had a big challenge. They had to actually help us suppress some of the very hot, sourcey looking, wet, specular highlights on all the people's clothing, the leather, the weapons. Um, and from there, we had to figure out, okay, how are we going to integrate with the live action plates, which we have to match to to a certain degree, of course, but also make it work so that it looks like it's in the stormy daytime. So to do that, we started with the HDRIs that were captured on set. And luckily, Ben Snow and Philippe Rabor had great foresight um, in wanting to capture as much data off the set as possible. So Duncan Blackman was there on set. He captured multiple 
um, spheres in the dry conditions, in the wet conditions, um, at multiple locations. And so we had all of the exact information of where the lights were on the set um, in 3D space. We had a LIDAR scan of the set. Um, and from there, we could start thinking about, OK, we have all the actual data of how it looks. Now how do we go from here and mash that up into something that looks like it's daytime in a storm. So for lighting the actual arc, say, for argument's sake, um, is it the approach that you were going down a physically plausible lighting setup so you just built some kind of artificial HDR to use as the lighting dome for that, or were you just getting in there with a bunch of area lights and trying to kind of light it more artistically? So I started with the actual data we had. And um, with Duncan's help, we could actually solve the 3D light positions. So we had the actual um, information of every single light that was on set of the cranes. And I built 3D rigs based on different camera angles and positions on the set for sort of the, the key lighting setups that they had. Um, and from there, uh, I pretty much used from the top of the tree lines down for the actual um, 3D environment that we used and then changed the kind of upper half of the sphere so that um, it would reflect more of the sky we wanted instead of, you know, pitch black night. Yeah. And by combining those together, we had the lights that we could use to light and get a base starting point to match the people, but then we could take artistic license to. Because in those bigger wide shots, there were massive sims uh, for you know, a lot of the crowds and stuff coming in. So of course you got a lot of light lighting control over those. Um, but I guess even for, for that kind of environment, it isn't just a matter of being mathematically accurate, right? Like you want to make it look good from a directorial point of view. Yes, definitely. Um, so we took more care to actually match the plates when we were close in. Um, you have these shots where you're seeing um, people right in front of the camera um, and the arc, which was sometimes CG, sometimes the actual set. And that was built, built what, in, in Long Beach, was it? The yes. big set? Yes. And that's where you were getting the plate uh, HDRs from? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we would match those quite quite closely and those were a whole challenge in themselves because there was so much integration between the digital doubles and the watcher creatures um, actually swiping through the people stomping them and stuff but when you could see um, these wider shots um, we had a little more leeway of not having to match the plate as much because there was more CG than live action so we could give it a little bit more of that overcast feel depending on the camera angle. But of course, if we stopped there, you'd have had enough on your plate, but then effectively it's flooding because of the water coming in. And so now you were saying you're using from the, the trees down, but, but by that stage, the down bit would have been inaccurate because it, you wouldn't have had a flood on set. So all of the huge amount of reflectivity from the water would have not been there. So even that would have been, I presume, Something you had to, to <laughs> yes, we, we had to deal with um, all those different situations. We had different um, you know material settings for everything based on distance from the camera, uh, depending on which way you were looking towards the arc or towards the back tree line, um, different environment um, for the ground uh, that was more ambient than close up where it was more contrasty where you would see immediately um, the lit ground from the big crane lighting and stuff like that. So we did have to account for multiple situations. Wow. Was this a, was this a katana show? Did you yes. do a, right. How'd you find that? It was, it was great. Um, it allowed us to, um, you know, with the Alembic um, caches, we could pretty much take the data wherever it needed to be, whether it was into Houdini or Maya or Katana um, so that we could all share the data. And then lighting, um, the, the simulations for the crowd were done in massive. And then we would bring in the particle files um, into Katana. And 
uh, from a sequence level, we had all of our different light rigs based on the position on the set, the camera angle, and so we could lop off sections of the sequence to different lighting TDs, um, and it was super easy to share information. Casino, of course, which has been honored this year with the SciTech Award, is very good at that kind of scene description and allowing you to break stuff apart, and I presume another part of that was the water sims as well. Yes, yes. It's, it's definitely a different way of working um, because everything's cached. Uh, you don't have access to, to each part of the cache as easily. Um, but it must be a hell of a lot faster to open a file. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> hell of a lot of faster to open a file. It can be tricky when you need to you know, drill down and find specific PDBs or a specific piece of geometry sometimes. Um, but we found lots of ways to make that easier for people. Now you were a render man show, was that right? You were rendering the sequence? Yes. Yeah. So uh, presumably, um, obviously there's a lot of flexibility in render man, but I'm I, I guessing that you went to the sort of physically based, uh, physically plausible shader type um, model for how you're working with that? Yes, yes. Um, so we did extensive look development on the watchers um, and we also did procedural shader tricks to um, make it look like water was running down them um, and displaced off of the rock. So that was pretty cool and we adjusted that um, based on distance from the camera. Um, and then the digital doubles as well had to be a close match. Because you had to have that thing. lighting working on a lot of these really close ups, but I mean also huge wide shots because like, things about two football fields wide, right? So for those yeah. big shots, it's a, it's a vast difference in scale. Yes, definitely. And of course, that's where having different settings for specular size and all those kinds of things definitely comes into play because it wasn't uh, like one setting fits all kind of situation. You had to test out different um, types of shots and tune things to work for each scenario. So one of the things that ILM's really good at is producing digital doubles that allow, obviously, everything from the massive sims to work really well, but also safety for actors in the cases of various stunts. But there's a lot of stuff going on here. Did you have any tricks or techniques to kind of integrate those into that wet environment? Uh, yes, we definitely did a lot of look development to um, develop the right kind of um, wet look on all the different materials of their clothing, on their metal weapons and their helmets um, because they had to be an exact match because it's so obviously um, close and integrated in a lot of those shots. And you don't want to give away when you know a watcher is slapping a digital double guy away. You want it to look real and raw. So we had to do a lot of work to make them really look dead on. Um, and the cranes that were on set were only so high. Um, so we actually had to adjust the whole light rig up because the watchers would have been right under the lights. So there was a trick of kind of finding a balance between um, you know, the hotness versus the ambient look on the people and the watchers and having everything work together. Yeah, I mean, that's the fundamental problem you have with uh a sky dome or the real life I guess versus a, a tower which is you get close to the tower obviously you're going to get a bunch of stops hotter where it doesn't matter where you move normally you're not going to get a bunch of stops hotter versus the sun. Yes yes so that was a big that was a big issue we definitely had to fine-tune that and figure out um, how do we match these people but we don't want them to look saucy we don't want them to look lit by a bunch of spotlights in the middle of the night on a set um, so how do we tune that and how far can composite go with suppressing the highlights um, so that we can still match what's really there but not have it look like it's too hot. Sounds like the compositors really had their work cut out for them to get that. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. They did, a, oh, they did so much work um, just adding elements, adding rain, um, figuring out how to just get everything to be mashed well. The new term has just opened over at FXPHD and it's a cracker. Here are the boys to fill you in on what's new this term that will allow you to take your career to the next level.
Hi, and welcome to FX PhD's new April term. I was trying to sum up to someone new the other day what FX PhD kind of aims to do. And it really comes down to this. We want you to be that guy or the girl that someone says, hey, get that guy. That's the guy, he gets it. And if you look at a script, we want you to be able to say, oh, that's what they want to do. I know how to do that. <laughs> So for me, I've got to say, as an instructor, the joy is hearing someone say, oh, now I get it. That makes sense to me. Now I know what it is. And to be that guy, you have to be able to say, I know how that works under the hood. I know all about that. And that's what FX PhD is. It's knowledge and understanding, both on the tools and the process. It's much more than just this button here or there. It's hardcore experienced instructors from top facilities all over the world saying to you, that's what's possible, that's how we do it, and that's why we do it. That's PhD, at least we hope. And so this term in our O-Week video, we've decided to split it up into three separate groups for you. We've got motion graphics, 3D, and compositing. Now these are 11 new courses in total, but they just add to the dozens of other full courses on offer and scores of other courses available in the vault. Coming up, we're going to run through those new 11 courses, including a Bifrost for Mayo in Mayo 2015, amazing Nuke and Houdini courses, new fun Microsoft Connect hacking, matte painting, a speed grading course. And at the end, I'll outline the thousands of dollars of free software, all without watermarks that you can use throughout the term. Anyway, let's get started and cross now to my co-founder, John Montgomery, in sunny Santa Monica. Well, thanks for that, Mike. And yes, I'm going to be starting with our motion graphics design-based courses on offer this term at FX PhD, and we've got three of them, starting with the return of one of our FX PhD members' favorite profs, Tim Clapham. So let's hear from him what he's got planned for the term. Hey, Tim Clapham here, and it's great to be back for a new term here at FX PhD. And this time I've got some really exciting new projects to share with you guys for Cinema 4D. Now, of course, a motion graphics course wouldn't be complete without covering the MoGraph module, and we'll be certainly looking at that and how we can use that in our day-to-day -day workflow. In this example, you can see that we've got MoGraph um, working in harmony with the Dynamics module. We'll be looking at how we can create a setup like this um, to bring some typography onto our screen. In this example here, we're using MoGraph and effectors to drive keyframe animation. And we'll be looking at a variety of techniques uh, based around this concept, um, and you will be left with uh, a tool set that you can use in your day-to-day -day production work. Of course, no motion graphics project is complete without audio, so we'll be looking at how we can harness the audio, how we can control it, and how we can create a kind of custom sound waves such as this example here. And we'll be using a technique very similar to this to create a, an ID from concept to completion. We'll be looking at other features from the application, such as this example here, where we are creating um, some cloth simulations. But as well as using cloth, you can see at the bottom here, we're also using hair in combination with cloth, so that as our cloth sim runs, the hair reacts in a natural way to create some really nice procedural animation. Many of the methods that we're going to cover throughout the term are derived from real-world projects that have been produced at Lux here in Sydney um, with real clients. So you're going to come out of this course with um, an expanded tool set which will allow you to take these techniques into your everyday projects and really enhance the kind of work that you're producing. Not only will we look at tips, tricks, techniques, but we'll also be creating a few projects from beginning to end. Um, so it should be a really exciting term and I'm looking forward to seeing you all on the forums. Also returning to FX PhD this term to teach a new motion graphics based course is Mark Bowie, who's taught a lot of really great offerings for us in the past. And in this term, he's gonna kind of have a project-based focus. It's a combination of motion graphics design, live action, and a lot of cool tips and tricks. Let's hear from Mark what he's got planned for his new course. So Mark, your course is called Graphical Angles for Motion Design. Why, why angles? Well, okay, I mean, there's two different angles going on there, I think. Firstly, one of the things that we're really trying to do here is just not start straight away and, you know, go straight into After Effects and begin to bash things out. One of the ideas is to actually get a number of different angles and ideas or concepts or, or creative approaches before you actually then go straight away and, and begin to do your thing. Um, but also I think there's a lot of angles in there as well because a couple of the, the main sort of um, filmic uh, sequences which uh, we're going to approach are kind of infographic sequences that you see in movies um, do involve a lot of angles and a lot of data as well, I think. So there's a bit of a, a, a play on the title as well. I mean, one of the things I'm really interested in, I think, is, is just to have some ways whereby 
The typography itself does more than just sort of appear in a box and kind of write across. Because that's the sort of thing, isn't it? It's a bit like a, a character. You actually want a sense of backstory, a sense of purpose. Mm. Even though the infographics may themselves not be immediately recognisable to the audience, you want them to feel like they come from a culture, from an environment. They yes. Have yeah, very much so. And I mean, I think this is definitely one of the things the course is about as well. We definitely want to kind of stitch those two layers together so that they both act as characters, if you like, the kind of the underlay, which is the um, pre-shot footage, and then the overlay, which is the graphics. So it doesn't sort of stand apart. It actually just sort of really emphasises and, and, and gives weight to the actual kind of filmic feel of the whole thing. Now, you're going to be operating mainly in a design sense and then in an After Effects as the sort of primary tool? Yeah, we'll use a couple of different particle uh, effects and some uh, uh, flares and other things like that as well. But predominantly, yeah, it's, it's, it's After Effects where we put this in. But we will um, do a little bit of work first, I think, in, in Illustrator and Photoshop. OK, and we're also going to be, what, looking at other references and, and a few other sequences? Yeah, look, I mean, very much so as well. It's not just about kind of infographics as well. It's a, it's a kind of graphical uh, programme. But, I mean, there's, there's, there's other bits. I mean, even just sort of looking at the way that titles work and coming up with ideas for creating titles that go with the characters on screen, even to the extent that one of the characters got quite a nice shirt on, you know. So uh, we took, I took uh, different elements from that and made them part of the way that the, uh, the words actually came up. Yeah, I do love it when title sequences really relate to the content and, um, and come out of it. It's a very current way of doing things and I, I think it looks really good. Yeah, I mean, everything's, everything's sort of very organic and alive at the moment. and It sort of feels free to, you know, flip and wipe on and come out of you in 3D space. So let's do some of that. Well, it's not often you hear the words nuke and motion graphics design in the same sentence, but I think the reality is you are hearing that more and more nowadays. And we're really excited this term to have a new course being taught by Josh Galbencia. And it's covering motion graphics-based design in both nuke and moto, which really make a great tag team of products, so to speak, to create great motion graphics designs. Hello, my name is Josh Galbencia, and welcome to Nuke 225, Nuke and Moto Fundamentals for Design. In this course, we'll explore the roles of Nuke and Moto in broadcast and motion graphics design. We'll also take a brief look at Photoshop and After Effects and where they fit in the pipeline and they can help assist us. First, we'll start off in Moto. We'll do a quick overview of the interface and then jump right into the modeling, setup, and texturing of our 3D scene and logos. We'll also look at some other features in Moto, such as dynamics and taking our 3D scenes and exporting them for import directly inside of Nuke. Finally, we'll set up our renders for multi-channel EXRs to be comped and finaled in Nuke. Next, we'll hop into Nuke and create our final images. We'll look at rebuilding our multi-pass renders using utility passes, such as motion vectors or Z-depth, to create effects for our image. And then we'll look at how we can import our moto scenes to help bring our composites to the next level. We'll round it out by adding the final touches such as lensing effects like flare, chromatic aberration, and all the other final touches inside of Nuke. Throughout the course, we'll briefly step into After Effects and Photoshop and show how their strengths can enhance our design and animations. This is going to be a steady paced class, making sure we cover the fundamentals of the two programs, but also look at some cool advanced features that will get us those great looking renders and final shots we're after. Well, I'm a big sucker for cool motion graphics and live settings such as concerts and things like that. In this term, we've got our first ever offering in Touch Designer. And that's a software application that's used in a wide variety of applications, from installation art to the concerts that I mentioned, DJ sets, as well as just motion graphics in commercials and films. Teaching the course is a new prof for us this term at FXPHD, and that's Mary Frank. And we're really excited to have her join us for this new offering. Touch 101 is an introduction to Touch Designer, a high-level graphic programming environment that is a powerful tool for real-time video, projection mapping, and rapid development. I've been using Touch Designer for the last four years for such varied applications as large-scale projection mapping installations, uh, custom concert AV systems, and data visualization. In this course, we're going to cover a lot of information with a focus on how to use Touch Designer for interactive installations. We'll start by taking a look at controlling video playback and also a good example of using different operator types together to make software. We'll make playlists, players that play specific sections of clips, and a VJ-style clip launcher. For any project, but especially one with screen-based interaction, it's important to make a good UI. We'll build UIs with panel properties and later look at how to override our screen controls with controller or gestural input. 
I'll show you how to use Touch OSC, a MIDI controller, and a Microsoft Connect with Touch Designer, and how easy it can be to switch up your controller. You'll get comfortable writing scripts and using variables and expressions. Don't worry if you've never used scripts or expressions before. We'll tackle scripts first incrementally, then with a focus on having scripts that run in response to user interactions. We'll spend three classes working on real-time rendering, tackling procedural and keyframe animation, Plus, I'll show you how to use instances and particles and demonstrate lighting techniques and materials, including uh, how to use GLSL shaders and Touch Designer. Then, we'll look at how to set up our video output and do projection mapping. You'll learn how to integrate 2D and 3D projection mapping tools into your projects. Finally, I'll show you how to use Python and Touch Designer to powerfully extend it. Well, our next new course at FX PhD that we're going to talk about is in speed grade. Now, obviously, that's not a motion graphics-based application. But the reality is, I think, with the Creative Cloud subscription, more and more people are actually taking a look at it. But the question is, how do you use it? How do you use it within the Adobe workflow? And when would you use it in addition or in place of Resolve? And that's where Robert Rufo jumps in. He's a new prof with us this term at FX PhD. He's going to basically work through the best practices of when and how to use SpeedGrade in your workflow. Hi, I'm Rob Rufo, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to share with you not only my knowledge of speed grade and frankly my love for speed grade but also um, a philosophy of color grading that goes with using speed grade effectively yes you will learn all the buttons and where they are and how to reach them and you will be the button ninja on speed grade by the end of this course but i think more importantly um, i'm hoping to uh, share some insights into how to think about color in the speed grade way, which is about enhancing images and bringing out what they already are, not reinventing them with a million gadgets. Speed grade doesn't have a million gadgets, but the tools it does have are actually better than most other color graders. The HSL here, for example, is extremely clean. The, its equivalent of lift gamma gain is much more powerful than how that works in other software and you know capable of amazing stuff super fast but you know I, to get there you have to start thinking about color in a new way you know i've been in color suites uh you know the best color suites in la and new york the ones that are three four thousand dollars an hour or whatever and what you see in those suites is people grading kind of the speed grade way not throwing a lot of gadgets, keeping it simple. You know, if they're using DaVinci, those guys, they'll use one, two, three nodes. And in the same way, speed grade forces you to think that way. And so together we're gonna to learn how to grade that way, to learn how to grade how real masters do, uh, with love and respect for the images they're working with. We're gonna be delving very deep into perceptual science, the psychology of color, because when you know the psychology, you don't need 20 power windows. You just need a little shift in color and you're bringing out the story all the more. Uh, and we're also gonna be getting into how to integrate speed grade with your overall Adobe workflow. Using certain tricks, there's now possibilities for using all these software together uh, that give you a level of power that really didn't exist before. Um, you can use After Effects, you can use Mocha, you can use all these things judiciously when they're warranted to create a, a whole arsenal that's massively powerful. By the end of this course, I hope not only you'll have learned a new software, not only how to integrate it into your existing Adobe workflow, but how to think about color in a whole new way. Thanks, John. Look, it's no secret that I personally believe that effects artists are some of the most important people in adding production value. Sim work has grown not only in leaps and bounds in terms of what we can do, but in how long it takes to do it. So really proud to have a couple of cracking new Sims courses on offer, starting with Maya and the new Bifrost in Maya 2015. Now, depending on when you're watching this video, the new version may not quite just be out yet, but don't worry, in the first week, we're actually gonna set the stage with Maya Fluids, and then in week two, move into Bifrost because it's incredibly important how Bifrost interacts with the rest of Maya. Well, I'm gonna get Liam to explain it. Liam Waterhouse is new to FX PhD. He's an ex-ILM uh, technical director. He worked on films like Transformers 3. Great guy, and we're really proud to have him here. This course will be an introduction to Bifrost, which is Autodesk procedural effects platform that lets you generate photorealistic liquid simulations in Maya. 
Developed from the renowned Nyad technology, which has been used in many of the best blockbuster feature films to include large-scale water effects, Bifrost was designed to provide artists with a powerful and scalable liquid simulation tool using simple and efficient workflows. In this course, we will learn how to combine Bifrost accelerators, particle-based droplets, and collision objects to create all types of liquids like splashes and waves, then preview the effect interactively in Viewport 2.0 in Maya. For any effects TD or Maya generalist, Bifrost will become an invaluable tool to create realistic fluid simulations at high detail. During this course, we will be covering all the main areas of the new software, including background simulating, fluid containers, emitters, colliders, kill planes, setting attributes for the fluid, Bifrost droplets, diagnostic colors, painting Bifrost attributes, adjusting shader attributes, how to increase accuracy and resolution, meshing and rendering simulations, and tips on how to iteratively work according to director's comments to final a shot. By the end of the course, you'll have a firm understanding of Autodesk Bifrost and how to produce amazing high detail simulations efficiently. Next we have two Houdini courses, 2.10 and 2.11, covering wire and cloth with Andrew Lau, as well as a Houdini ocean effects with Nick Nimble. Let's start with Andrew and have a look at how wire and cloth simulation can add more realism into many situations involving actually non-character effects tasks. Hi, I'm Andrew Law, and I'm very excited to be teaching this course on Houdini wire and cloth simulation. Um, here's a few of the things I've personally had to do on feature film with wire and cloth. For instance, lots and lots of bendy, stretchy, interactive vegetation definitely has its uses for that. Of course, I've uh, also had to use it for things like bending and breaking roots, uh, destruction, things that you wouldn't really sink its present for, such as like bendy dirt, or occasionally when someone has to uh, bang into a tree. Tons of other uses such as destruction, uh, wires, uh, things tearing apart, things breaking. So the first example for the class will be using a speed tree and we'll put wires inside of this speed tree and use it to simulate and also deform um, high-res geometry and as well as a particle simulation. I think this course will double as an advanced SOPS course as well and we'll explore a lot of different procedures to get there. Here's an example of a cloth simulation I did with Massive on Invictus. Houdini has great cloth capabilities. Um, I think this is a perfect application for something like Houdini. So we'll introduce cloth and we'll put together a basic cloth example with a flag and use that for a crowd uh, in a stadium. For our final project of the course, we're going to destroy the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Uh, here you can see a lot of applications for bending, tearing, metal, um, supports and wires, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, so yeah, in this course we'll be doing lots of advanced geometry, uh, wire and cloth simulation, both theory and application, uh, as well as just general destruction uh, best practices. My name is Nick Nimble, and this term we're going to dive into ocean effects in Houdini. With the release of Houdini 13, SideFX has extended their ocean effects tools. Which is great, but as you will find, you still need to take quite a few hurdles if you want to put a boat on a rough or rising wide ocean. This is a 200 level project based course aimed at experienced Houdini users who are looking to expand their skills. In this course we are going to create a full CG ocean shot of a boat on a rough ocean. We will learn how to break it down into separate elements and how to plan for those. The main challenge of this course is how do we blend between the flip simulation directly around the boat and the horizon stretching procedural ocean in a way that we can seamlessly blend between the two in Nuke. On top of that we stack additional layers of effects to create extra realism. So there are a few things I would like to touch upon. Um, one of them is the keyframe animation of the boat, which is, as you can see, utterly simple. And then uh, we're going to use an advanced uh, projection method to uh, actually project the boat onto the ocean and make it respect the waves. And we're going to use chops to actually enhance that animation quite a bit. A question often asked in forums is how do I isolate the, the top surface of a meshed flip simulation? Well, in order to blend between the procedural ocean and the flip simulation, we actually need to do that. So we're going to look into how to achieve that. 
and then the top surface will uh, feed into the node that will actually blend between the flip simulation and the procedural animation. This is a challenging course, and you will get an insight in the day-to-day -day work of a Houdini FX TD. It is important to remember that the larger facilities in our industry, like ILM, Weta, or Double Negative, have very extensive render farms that put those enormous effects on screen. And through this course, you're going to learn how labor and computationally intensive those ocean effects actually are. And you're probably going to appreciate them even more so because of that. I hope you are as enthusiastic about this matter as I am, and I'll see you in class. You know, for the last few terms, we've been trying to add more games engines and odd courses that are perhaps outside a traditional post pipeline. And this term, that course, is our Microsoft Connect 101. It's for fun, hacks and real-world usability by Morris May. And I'm so looking forward to this myself. I'll let Morris explain. Hi, my name's Morris May. We're going to learn to use a Microsoft Connects for a variety of uses. We're going to look at lots of different types of software. And we'll look at using it in a real-world environment. And we'll have some fun and learn to hack. One of the things we'll be learning to do is scan. So we'll scan 3D models. We'll even print them and host them on the web. And we'll look at a different variety of software to do this. We're also going to set up our own motion capture studio. For a minimal cost, we'll look at using our own motion capture studio in our living room. And we'll look at the usability of this in real world production for things like games, real television commercials, and also just fun games and hacking around. We're also going to look at some of the interesting projects that people do at the Connects. This is an example I found on the web of some really interesting hand puppetry. So we'll learn all kinds of different examples of interesting things that are being done. We're going to look at some really interesting art projects that people do too. And one of our classes will focus on creating some interesting art. The Connects can be used to even trigger sound. So this gives a whole new possibility. Sound and speech recognition allow you to create really interesting projects. And this is just an example of one of the things we're going to learn. This is real-time markerless motion capture. So we'll basically look at how head tracking works, how to map ourselves on different models. We'll even do super fun things like, I don't know, become orcs and things. It's going to be super fun. Can't wait to see you in class. The last group of courses we have on offer is, I think, the heart of FX PhD, and that's visual effects and compositing. And we've got two new courses. The first one is an intermediate level new course. Now, several terms ago, we introduced you to a short film that we're working on called The Last Chick. The basic premise is about a young woman who wakes up and finds a city void of people and revolves around her experiences dealing with that. Now, as you can imagine, in a city like Mexico City with over 8 million people, there's going to be a lot of work to be done and clean up and other tasks. And we're really excited to have a new prof with us this term teaching the course, and that's Victor Perez. Hi, I'm Victor Perez, and I wanted to introduce you to the new Nuke 226 Painting and Reconstruction Techniques with Nuke X. You know, removals, 3D projection setups, and digital map painting fundamentals are essential skills for a compositor, but mastering these techniques requires a high level of technical understanding in order to facilitate the work, increase the speed, and improve your results. When we think about compositing, we usually think about adding stuff on top of the plate, because, of course, it's the most obvious task. But compositors also spend a lot of their time removing stuff instead of adding it. You know how it works. This is the kind of job that, when it's well done, nobody notices it. So I have designed this course to take you to the next level in the hard craft of painting and removing elements from a shot in a simple, still technically advanced way. All tracking and geometry generation in here is created within Nuke X8. And we will integrate also MARI to the workflow for more articulated and complex projection paintings. This is a project-oriented course. The guys have been shooting a short film in Mexico, and we will work with those shots to perform massive crowd removals in real production environment. Because, sure, everybody can remove a microphone tip or a little rig on the screen, but can you remove all the people from the overcrowded streets of Mexico? We are talking now. 
Last term we had the first course in our new digital map painting curriculum, and it's being led by artist Ludovic Iochem from Double Negative in London. It's really a great, gonna be a great curriculum overall, with the idea being we have three really solid courses, term after term, building through the process of what it takes to make a feature film quality map painting. In this term, we have the second course that's part of that curriculum. Hey guys, I'm Ludovic Yoshem and I'm very happy to be back on FXPHD for this new term with you. So for this new term, we're going to split it in two big projects. On the first one, we, we are going to create um, an environment of a panorama of mountains, something like this one, but from scratch. And we're going to project uh, each layer on the different cards and set up a small camera move to add a bit of movement in the environment. Then we're going to do a daily session which is uh, basically I'm going to pick some of your work and I'm going to review it, adding some uh, paint over and try to explain how to make it look more realistic. The second project of this term will be another projection setup, but this time based on uh, a real plate. Uh, so I'm going to try to shoot something with a camera and then I'm going to provide you uh, the mesh move. So we have uh, the camera and everything that we need to do the, the environment. So based on this plate, we're going to work on a matte painting and we are going to see how we can reproject the DMP and uh, slap compete with the original plate. And for the final class, again, we're going to do another daily session and try to see how we can improve your work. It's really helpful to look at some real work and just uh, explain what's wrong and see how we can fix all of this. So I hope uh, I'm going to see you on this new term and I'm really looking forward to work with you. See you guys. Is that it? Heck no. <laughs> you also get a free weekly magazine class called Background Fundamentals that gives you an insight into the latest tech, behind the scenes, in-depth technical discussions and covering the more serious side of what we do, the business side of the industry. Plus, as a member of FX PhD, you get for your showreel to use free just that piece of software that you wanted to learn. In fact, actually, there's thousands of dollars worth of software available from our VPN, from Houdini to RenderMan, from Nuke to Maya, Cinema 4D, just a wealth of high-end professional software, all available at your disposal. Plus, you get the power of consulting and chatting with the profs in the forums. This is not a passive experience. This is just so much more than that. You'll get I guess our years of experience in dealing with recruiters and companies to know exactly what it is that's current right now. What is that kind of killer piece of knowledge, that killer app? What's the key tool, the latest technique? That's us. That's FX PhD. Come join us and take your career to the next level. I'm Mike Seymour. Thanks so much. See ya. Well, that's it for this week, but we'll be back shortly at ILM for Captain America Winter Soldier, which, mind you, looks awesome. Don't forget our VFX show podcast, where a panel of the guys review the VFX in films like Noah, Captain America, and lots of others. You can find it on iTunes or on the site. And you know, it's worth checking out because each show covers one film, and I'm told it was, you know, designed to listen to while doing Roto or waiting for complex sims, stuff like that. Until then, I'm Angie. See ya. For more industry news, in-depth features, podcasts, and forums, check out fxguide.com. And for visual effects training, check out fxphd.com.